Dr. Lewis was always timely about it, and I thought she was going to be here tonight. So, she's not, is she? Oh, there she is. Oh, her face is already red. Goodness. Well, one of the things that happened this, this year was Dr. Lewis uh, became halftime faculty and halftime retiree. And how you are a halftime retiree, I am not quite sure. But in order to guard her time, she resigned her position as the academic side of the Pearson professor, and she left it to me. Now, I've been thinking, should we applaud Dr. Lewis for all that she's done? But wonder about her. biology class, but here to learn all about how you represent the biological world in folk painting. I know that's what you're what you're here for. Uh, when you go at the end of the at the end of the lecture, there will be this pad on the back table with a pen, and if you just sign that one, that'll prove you were here. Uh, I know he said take the program and sign it, but you don't quite have the program. But you can take that, and I'll sign it too. That's okay. I have somebody running here. So that's our business. I also want to recognize uh, a couple of special people in the audience tonight. Uh, as you notice, we have a, a small exhibit out, uh, outside of uh, locally made, locally manufactured, and some Chicago manufactured uh, Swedish American Kurbitz paintings. And there's a little uh, buff three page flyer that tells you all about the exhibit. But we have with us tonight uh, Mr. Steve Scott, who, who did the flamingo. And if you want to, want to do one for you, give him a hand. <laughs> and, we have, and we have Carla Wilson, who, uh, who created the, uh, the box and the tray with Carbage Painting. Carla? Where's Carla? There she is. <laughs> if you want to special order something from Carla, she will we'll be, be glad to do that for you. We have with us uh, Rita Walker, who taught a whole generation of Kerbitz painters here at Tyler. <laughs> and last but not least, who he snuck in late and is sitting in the back row, uh, the gentleman who's painted over 32,000 dollar horse house signs. <laughs> at least that's what he claims, and I am not one to dispute it. <laughs> Mr. Ken Schubert. This, uh, this is our 2012 Pearson Professor first lecture. The Pearson Professor Committee works very hard to bring to the campus a noted Swedish scholar. Uh, and you will remember some of the scholars we've had in the past, included Peter Savalainen, uh, uh, last year Gordy Arco. Um, uh, this committee works very hard. And it works very hard because Noni Strand is not simply our campus pastor. She is also our campus uh, buggy whip operator, uh, pusher, uh, the driving force behind this committee. We could not get along without her. Other members of our committee include <coughs> Stephanie, Stephanie McDonald, who's worked with Barbara to get her slides in order, uh, Jane Anderson, Candy Davis, who made lots of arrangements for us through the President's office, and Joanne Madison, who has been sure that all the visa I's and T's are, are dotted and crossed, um, and John Koykendall, who stepped in at the last minute when Bob Schmoll decided that there were greener pastures in Pennsylvania, so fine. Last but not least, our committee uh, has been blessed with having Charlotte Anderson uh, to uh, do the lion's share of the work. Uh, you really don't know how much work Charlotte has done to bring us to this, to this day. <laughs> Charlotte has gone down to the airport. She's, gone, she's saw, seen to all of Barbara's material needs. She has taken her uh, any place that she needs to go. And she's done it all in Swedish, which makes Barbara feel a little less homesick. <laughs> uh, thank you, Charlotte. I, I, 
I am forever grateful. Uh, in addition, I want to recommend, recognize quickly the, me member, the members of the President's Council, who whether they knew it or not, were material contributors to the success of this program. That includes, of course, our brand new dean, who walked on the scene and, and we said, what do we do? And he said, well, <laughs> What's your objective? <laughs> Great deal. Um, our interim CFO, Richard Metz, who just got here this week and is already signing checks. We like that. We want to recognize Galen Budding, our interim uh, VP for money laundering. I mean fundraising. <laughs> I get confused. It's, it's the drugs. It's the drugs. Um, it was through the efforts of several members of the advancement department over the years. Jane Norland is here and it was part of her efforts uh, and certainly um, our all of our past workers in this office uh, met with the Pearson family, encouraged them to endow this program and uh, helped them, uh, help the Pearson family to continue to endow this program so that we will have Pearson professors for many years to come. I uh, also want to recognize Matt Carver, Carver, who I don't think is here tonight, but Matt has been struggling to try to help the Swedish computer talk to an American network. <laughs> and, uh, and the other members of the council, Tricia Hawk, Daniel Dentino, and Robert Carlson, and of course, though he's not here, our president. Uh, we are truly grateful for, for our president's encouragement and support. Charlotte was out when he applauded for her. Charlotte, I said nice things about you. <laughs> they applauded you. This evening's main event is, uh, is a welcome lecture by uh, Dr. Barbara Klein, the 2012 Pearson Distinguished Professor of Swedish Studies. Professor Klein is a professor emerita of ethnology at Stockholm's University and director emerita and permanent fellow at the Swedish Collegium for Advanced Study. I'm sure that has a genuine <laughs> Swedish name, but I don't know it. She received her doctorate in folklore studies and anthropology at Indiana University uh, and has taught at numerous institutions, including the University of California at Berkeley, the University of Pennsylvania, and at the University of Bergen in Norway. She's written extensively on oral narration, rituals, museums, displays, and other forms of expressive culture in complex multi-ethnic settings, primarily in the United States and Northern Europe. Her work in publications, which is extensive, involved folk folkloristics, ethnology, anthropology, and museology. I first encountered Dr. Klein's work in the text that accompanied the exhibit on Swedish folk culture, All Tradition is Change. The fundamental thesis of that exhibit and that work was not intellectually difficult. Tradition changes, is changing, and will change. However, emotionally, I was convinced that I was doing tradition properly, and all those other people we're doing it wrong. And here was a collection of Swedish scholars essentially telling me that there was no proper way to perform tradition, which was shocking. Shocking, I tell you. <laughs> but as I read and I looked, and now as I have listened to Professor Klein, I've relaxed and I've realized that yes, tradition will change and it will be what it becomes. Thank you, Barbara, for helping me see that. And now will you please join me in welcoming Dr. Barbara Klein as she speaks on the topic. Doll painting Sweden and Swedish America, the cultural history of heritage making. I'd love to begin by thanking all the people Carl has already thanked. <laughs> I have been so warmly welcomed by so many. Oh, perhaps I should mention those. Thank you so much, Noni. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Stephanie. Linda Lewis. Carl. Well, here I go. <laughs> but I am not going to do that. I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you. Um, what I will do tonight is to speak about a new phenomenon all of you heard of. Stop it. You know. I feel very daring to 
do this because many of you know a lot about dollar painting, especially dollar painting in the United States. Several of you here tonight are practitioners of the art. Indeed, nowadays there are probably more dollar painters in the United States than there are in Sweden. Indeed, Linsborg has many more wild and inventive dollar horses per square meter than any Swedish town I know. So, I will not speak so much about dollar painting in Linsborg. I couldn't do that. Instead, I will focus on the beginning and early development of this art form. How did it begin and why? How did one of the most influential of the artists, Winter Karl Hansson, you see his name on the whiteboard? How did he really express himself? This is not a painting by Winter Karl Hansson, but by one of his pals, Jack and Anders. Or how did he express himself? How how dollar painting caught on the way it did. But I will also say a few words about the developments in the 19th and 20th century. How did we get from something like this that you see in front of you, complete with the chimney from coming out of the city of Jerusalem? How did we get from this to the shapes and forms? that you see all around you in this town today. How did we get from this to this wonderful display outside here? How did we get from this to the painting, the Ines' first home in time and detail? That really, look at the details there. Look at that attention to detail. I talk a lot about that. The smoke coming out of the chimneys. Look at all the details of the paintings of Ines' first home in Tanganyika. There are similarities. I hope you will find many more trans uh, similarities than I will even point to today. Before I start, for real, people always say this. <laughs> there are many jokes about it. But before, before I start for real, I'd like to emphasize something that's important, and that it is that it wasn't really thinkable to pose some of the questions I am posing today, and let alone thinkable to answer them with any kind of decency. It wasn't thinkable before Roland and Margareta Andersson, Anderson in Lexan published a huge inventory called Dog Mordery. You see the title? On the whiteboard, unfortunately, this book that came out in 2007 only exists in Swedish, but it is important to mention it. In this enormous book, we find documented, not necessarily by pictures, but we find documented about 3,000 known paintings from between the years 1780s through the 1800s about 350 folk artists were known to be at work at that. And the Andersons are now digitizing their efforts. So hopefully you can all someday just enter and look. Anyway, but this groundwork must be mentioned because it is basic to all interpretive efforts, including mine. And I might add, there aren't all that many Swedish scholars engaged in these interpretive efforts. So now, let me say a few words about an artistic tradition and how it develops. I will lecture. <laughs> I just want to. <laughs> um, of course, folk painting had existed in Dalarna and elsewhere in Sweden long before the late 18th century. Peasants had carved for centuries, they had woven textiles, knitted, but painted figures, painted figures in color, could be seen almost exclusively in churches or in aristocratic homes 
possibly in some vicarage or another. Actually, before the late 18th century, the churches were practically the only places where common people have seen figures in color. Uh, it is fascinating to reflect on over how narrow their visual worlds were compared to the our worlds, which are never ceased to existing in various colors, coming at us all the time. This was a different world. And the pictures on the work walls of the churches, they remain hugely influential also during the late 18th century. Uh, then this time, several things happened that all of a sudden set off this burst in uh, painting images and painting figures. It was all very quick. Uh, and this surge took place in Sweden and in many other places in Europe, in several rural regions, not everywhere, but this is complex. Uh, and it, the surge was particularly prevalent in southern Sweden, uh, now, now comes the test. That's right. Okay, here goes. Ah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, in this part of southern Sweden, smaller, southwestern smaller, and particularly here in Dalarna. This is Dalarna, the Dalarna part of Sweden. It's as you can see in south central. I mean, most of Sweden is still north of, of, of Dalarna. But both these districts are poor, they're full of wood and forest. Now the small land paintings are fascinating, but they never took off in the popular imagination the way that the Dala paintings did. So unfortunately I will leave the small land, the southwestern small land uh, paintings aside. Uh, that would be the subject for another <coughs> lecture. This is a uh, Johannes uh, in Breared, his rendition of the fall of Jericho. I, I love it. We <laughs> 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 are really fall. But that's as much as we're going to see of small painting today. So back to Donana. Mm -hmm. What happened in Donana in the last decades of the 1770s to set off a painting? So let me point to a few factors or a few contexts. I'm not going to do it all. And two really important intertwined factors are itinerant work and the making of small wooden objects. Uh, for hundreds of years, furniture, toys, and small pieces, the tools, that kind of thing. For hundreds of years, peasants in Dalarna had supplemented their income by being migrant workers. And they went far. They went up. There is. <coughs> this is really a poor area. But they went far. Some of them went all the way down to Stockholm. They walked. Or they would walk into Norway or much further <coughs> up north. They walked enormous distances. Uh, and this is how uh, they took part in building projects, or the women were acting to row the boats between the islands of Stockholm. But, like other peasants' artists, they were forbidden to make and sell furniture on a large scale. They were not allowed to compete with the guild carpenters. And those restrictions have been in effect since the Middle Ages. But in 1772, after a series of crop failures, King Gustav III had all these restrictions repealed. Actually, he was involved in big politics. He was really trying to please the peasantry in his efforts to uh, subjugate the aristocracy. He was a politician. But what he did in repeating all these former restrictions was that he encouraged the peasants of Dalarna, 
dolichardians to supplement their income with carpentry and all kinds of handicraft, in those days called slave. In English, you have the word slide. You see it on the board. So the king was in the act. But he also repealed other restrictions, and I find this so interesting. Because previously, prior to the 1770s, only guild members had been allowed to acquire imported pigments or colors. But in 1772, <coughs> anybody were allowed, was allowed to buy pigments, imported pigments. And then a lot of color mixtures and pigments were now available. The East India trade, which the king also supported, the East India trade had increased by hundreds of times the wares that one could buy. It was spices, tea, porcelain, and not these pigments. In other words, the huge European and American trade in colonial wares, a trade that was quite destructive for many poor people far east, this trade actually benefited the Swedish peasantry and it benefited the development of folk art. I love this. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, they grabbed on to their new freedoms and started making and painting furniture and other things to a much greater scale than before. They made cupboards, even learned, and some of them went to school with guild masters. Um, and they learned to decorate and paint in various styles. They mixed up styles. They mixed up rococo styles, the shells that you, you see a lot of examples. And uh, they also used the old Renaissance urn and made their new mixtures. And amazingly quickly, I keep saying that, but it was so quick. And this is because I discuss these quick movements with many historians, but amazingly quickly they developed there, what they sometimes themselves call the roots molding, same word as rosa molding, or the molding, meaning figure painting. Of uh, later on, this came to be known as kurbits. You see the word on the fight board. I'm not going to go into the story of how it came to be called kurbits because it's a long one. And if you're dying to know, I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> 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 but I'm serious. Yeah. But they painted on, and there was a burst of imagination at this time. But there was another important factor, perhaps the most important factor, why this painting got started, and that was books. Country people at this time started acquiring books. Literacy rose amazingly quickly in the late 18th century, both in Denmark and in Sweden. There's some wonderful books that have been written about that. And of course, most of the literature that common people could acquire was religious. Or particularly popular in rural homes were the so-called picture Bibles. And they had pictures either of etchings or woodcuts and brief texts. And here we have one of the kinds of pictures, the, or that fantastic one. These, there were new kinds of pictures for them at look at, to look at. This is the judgment of Solomon, or we come back to this. Um, that act, actually, we know, although this has not been well studied for the Dalekarians, we know that a number of those who sold Bibles and religious books were Moravians. In fact, there was a whole surge of preachers, pietistic preachers, who walked around the countryside. And they had something to do with saving these Bibles. So, the Dalekarya painters, they saw these picture Bibles, and they adapted the pictures they saw in quite some details, but in their own way. Now, one of my predecessors, Santa Svatch, who has studied this in a little different way. So here you have the Karl Hansel's rendition 
of the judgment of Solomon. This was what he looked at. And this is what became. Uh, now, I'm sure you all remember the text of, uh, from the first book of Kings, chapter, chapter 3, the story of the two harlots who had each given birth to a baby, and, but one of them had by accident suffocated her baby. But she also wanted to get hold of the other baby. In other words, both of them claimed the one remaining baby. And what did the wise King Solomon do? He suggested that the child would be cut. They were at the sword step. That the child would be cut in two halves. And at this point, one of the harlots leapt forward and screamed, no, 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 give the child to him. Don't cut him in half. And so that was the wise <coughs> judgment of Solomon that was celebrated in the Bible. And here we have it to be the cause of But look at what he had. The whole flower set up, that which later became known as his purchase, and the house. Why a house? There's no house. <laughs> There's a little bit of a mural you can see. He added all this, um, these kinds of details. So keep them in mind. And what about this juxtaposition of house and flower? Um, so, but let, before I go to meet the car, let me say a little bit more about the importance of printed material. It was so important that it could be said that the late 18th century folk art in Dodana developed in some symbiosis with print and reading. And this to me is fascinating because it is so frequently claimed that folk art is the art of the simple, unlettered people who, who and it just brings up from the hearts of the unlettered people. Dollar painting, the point is, dollar painting could not have happened without books and illustrations. By around the year 1800, just 20 years or so, the painting style of the dollar cardians of people such as Peter Card became a fashion among those farmers who could pay for it. Uh, and dollar paintings were sold after in the way to do home. And the painters walked all around central Sweden, as I said, and all around. A few painters could live off their paintings, but many of the less accomplished ones, they, you know, they used, they painted a bit on the side and they did a lot of other tasks as they walked. Uh, uh, and they also painted a bit on the side on horses and toys and whatnot. Actually, there is one story that some of them would make clock cases that were also become huge, big clock cases that were also becoming popular at this time. And they would fill up the clock cases with the toys and horses. And uh, and draw a few rows of paintings and drag them along on sleds as they walk along and use the small stuff to, to pay for their food and lodging or just as gifts or whatnot. We know of several families that walked around and worked together. In other words, some women were in fact involved in early doll painting. But it's badly, we have no really good record for this. And this is really interesting because in southern Sweden, we know of some great women painters from a little bit earlier than this. Anna Ström, that is one of them. But let's go to this artist. We, Winter Karl Hansson, I'm trying to say the real Swedish, Winter Karl Hansson. And I should at the, uh, explain the naming practices, if you look, can I depart from this? Uh, I mean, you can hear me, I know, but the screaming won't work. But uh, <laughs> if you look, winter, winter, that is the name of the farm. 
and Carl Hansen. His father was Hans Hansen. And in the naming practices of Dalarna at this time, people would be called by their farm and their first name. Still is true. So his name is Winter Karl. And that's how I'm going to refer to him. Absolutely no hyphen here. And you know, you, you, you may have encountered this, uh, this naming practice before. Um, Winter Karl was born. 1777 in the village of Ittemu in the parish of Lexi. It's, it's around Lexi. Yeah. Do I have to bring it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, it's in central Dalarna and right on the river Dalarna. And his father, Mr. Uh, Hans, was a village overseer and a school teacher, meaning that the car most likely was good at writing and reading. Um, his mother was a midwife, Margareta Lars, doctor, and he was the eldest of six children. This is kind of interesting, because he died very quickly. He was in 1805. In other words, he got to be 28 years old, which was not uncommon at this time. He died of pneumonia or a cold, it says in the parish books. And they also characterized him there as, uh, or they say in, in the parish books that his conduct in life had been Christian. <laughs> this is about all we know about him. Yet in those 28 years, he accomplished a great deal. We know about 60 paintings by him, and, so, and, they, uh, and new ones keep being discovered. Uh, he was also inspired by painters nearby. Uh, opposite the river was a village called Ulvi, which I should have written. <laughs> it's very famous. The Ulvi painters are very famous for the for some of the borders that they added uh, to their painting. You see some. And the ones, they, they are the ones that keep recurring on the dollar horses. In any case, I can easily imagine how Winter Carl would row across the river to meet with his pals in the village on the other side, or vice versa. Um, <coughs> all of them were itinerant painters, like well, the other dollar painters. They have, have been known to be painting together some houses. And they all lived ambulatory lives, but the, the car became the true pioneer, the trendsetter, and also in a way a peak of an early style. So let's look more carefully at uh, some of the 60 paintings that we painted. And can you see this one? You've probably seen it. I know I, I've been a, a part of exhibiting it once in the, the traveling exhibit in the United States. This is such an incredible masterpiece. Uh, in the status of life, was a popular topic, created and recreated over and over in many parts of Europe. Lots of East European examples are known. Many Jewish examples are known. But here we have the absolute masterpiece, all categories. I mean, look at it. Yes. I mean, it's enveloped by the flower style that became such a marker of the uh, Dalla painting. But, uh, but then, here you have the ascendancy, ascendancy, ascendancy. And then, as life is becoming more and more barren toward death, this tree is all barren, but this all. This is very fancy. But he was a master at so many details. Here you have the cradle, and this cradle is depicting the, what are these called in English? The, the ones that you use for rocking. Me and I. Yeah. Well, this is exactly the way one should, uh, one, uh, a cradle should be made in Lexan. It still is. It's still in this way, not any other. And here you have the deathbed, but also the beer. It was very common in Lexan. It still is that you put the beer right next to the deathbed and use this one to carry the body. 
to the cemetery. He's old. I mean, what do you inside here? I mean, the, the young Cuba being, and the one who's been caught by death. And it's, it's, it's a perfect symmetry that is so characteristic of folk art. At the same time as he breaks up the symmetry. I won't even start talking about how well he has depicted the uh, dress that people wore at the time. And no one has painted the stages of life, the stairs of life like he the car. But let's take another one. That's, uh, like all the do early dollar paintings, Bindicott's favorite biblical topics. Now this one has gotten truly faded. Uh, you can still, you can, it's, uh, you can find it in the uh, Zorn Museum in Mora. Um, and, but, lots and lots of the paintings, this is one of the real favorite motifs, the workers, the parable of the workers in the vineyard. Um, and uh, once again, a biblical history here. The paintings illustrate the parable, many of you know by heart. Uh, the Gospel of St. Matthew. The vineyard owner hires five groups of laborers, it is said in the Bible. He hires five groups of laborers during one day. But the ones who were hired during the last hour get the same pay as those who were hired in the morning. I wish to give the last month man the same as you, said the vineyard owner. Thinking about, I mean, I'm sorry it's so faded, but it is it's an elegant composition. If I didn't have that, this just has a cultic red, but that's a given name in history. But here they are, the vineyard workers, integrated, and the curbits, the flower, it's totally integrated with their work. And this one is living with a spade. This one has a wheelbarrow. This one is carrying heavy yokes. Being to call you about heavy work. All the dollar cards you. They knew about me, what it was like to be a hired laborer. It's no wonder that the parable was so popular among the Dala painters. But this is, of course, a brilliant execution of simultaneous uh, work because outside the gate is the uh, vineyard owner negotiating with a new group of laborers. And as was the custom at the time, they are all called their who are holding their hair, what is about to take off his hat. There is, there is all kinds of simultaneous action going on here. I'm sure most, many of you know all the jokes about these Swedish poor people when they came to the United States and all took off their hats all the time and bowed to those who were higher up in the hierarchy. I think the card has depicted that very well. <coughs> um, his painting brings us very close to everyday life in the 18th century. He brings us close to a life of toy in an unpredictable hierarchical world. But this is a fact. That life of toy, of drudgery, is enveloped in fantasy, play, mystery, Mystery flowers are enveloping these people who are working so hard. It's been said over and over that uh, Dada artists portrayed the physical world in a Dalekarian idiom. Yes, of course they did. But I can also say that they depict a Dalekarian world in which other times and other places are was magically present. Let's briefly look at another rendition of the parable of the vineyard by Winterkar. Uh, uh, this one presumably was done before the one at our last show. This one was found in a kitchen renovation in uh, uh, 
south of where Vidvik Khan lived in Orwell, uh, in 2007. So if you look it up on the map, you know, just find it there. It's now in the museum of Lala. And as you can see, it's very similarly organized with the other one. It's just reversed. And I'm not going to go into how they probably, we probably, we probably trace uh, some of their pictures. About why it became reversed, I have had long discussions. <laughs> I still don't quite understand it. Presumably they did it with me. But here you have other, this, this curve is, this star, this is a bit of trouble, I think. You can't find the roots. You probably realize that. It just develops as it reaches up to the higher regions. But look, here are other tools being used. There's Great, thank you. Uh, they are really sturdy shears. Uh, of course, this is probably, I don't know how they imagined that a vineyard would look. They certainly have never seen one. <laughs> but uh, let's look at another one of these. This is not the cause. This is one of his towns in the village of Ulvi. The Shon who survived the Intercom by many, many years. Um, now, so this one is, was made in 1805, you see that? It's very hard to know whether or not it was painted before or after the Intercom's death. But obviously, they share all kinds of ways of thinking, and therefore, painting should be alive. Uh, Bakhmur had another had a brother, also Bakhmur was very interesting. But he has really gone to town with the sheep. <laughs> 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 and, and now, this is my goof. Because you have a talk bubble there. And it goes on a little bit. You see? Uh, they, I think Bakhmur used talk bubbles. And some of the. the but uh, and uh, it says in, in, in translation, as the workers to come forward and give them wages. So we had a staircase going up here to one of the rare interiors, because these early painters hardly ever painted interiors of regular houses. You know? Interior state painting, very interiors in churches. Uh, but I don't know if you agree with me. I mean, to me, although this picture is enticing and the figures there, it lacks some of the the magic, some of the finesse of Victor Cross painting. painting, painting. Um, but the early painting. Did not paint only on individual walls or, or individual canvases. They painted entire houses, <coughs> entire farms. Sometimes they did so together. And let us now go further north in Rettwig to a village called Dinkur. It's right there. It's quite a ways away from that somewhere in the car lived. Um, and it's one of the most, so the village of Bingham, correct to the lawn, it's Gordon Farm, one of the most wonderful places you might wish to, to visit. And I, I didn't even have a sense to bring an exterior picture. Anyway, you walk in to any one of the houses and you met with a, an explosion of color. You also see an earlier version of the staircase of the ages of a staircase. Years of life. The Intercon is known to have painted in the dawn its Gordon farm at least three times in 1795, in 1999, and in 1801. And uh, the whole place, wherever you turn, is just uh, bursting with color. I mean, uh, there would be single, here's a perfect example of how they converted the or thought of the. Renaissance early on top there. Or this one. This is this is my. Well, the first time I saw this, I couldn't believe my eyes. I 
and it was one of those wonderful days, too, really, that helps. This is a bit unclear, this picture, but let's get a bit closer to what we see on the far wall there. That whole room that we see is covered in painting, but unless we want to sit here until midnight, I'm not going to look at it all. But here we have, uh, yeah, and this is a very contemporary uh, recent picture by Sidney uh, Garner of Albany. So you see into, this is the former kitchen of the uh, summer house. Takes a little while to get used to the painting, but of course you recognize what you have before you. Wintercott has painted the motif known as the descent from the cross. Many great artists have painted this motif. Rubens, Titian, Rembrandt, many others. But the motif is highly unusual in folk art. In fact, I have searched and searched and searched to find one example in Dalarna, none. And I have found absolutely no example in all over Northern Europe. And the, the text on the top of the painting echoes the second epistle of Timothy. Consider your savior, Jesus Christ, who has suffered for the sins of the world. And what do we see? Well, let me come back to it. All human action is concentrated to the lower left corner of the uh, uh, painting. Um, now there are two floral arrangements I mean, of the curvies, and then those kinds of decorative trees you see many examples uh, of. But what is the most of all on this painting? This huge aggregate of houses. It's some kind of urban aggregate. In, in fact, why did they build it? Paint all these towns and cities. Very ever, ever. Uh, they're all houses. No way. They, this is a huge aggregate of uh, houses. To some extent, you may blame the picture Bible. Some of the etchings on there are uh, uh, full of urban dwellings, but still. And of course, the straight lines of the houses are a nice artistic contrast against the fantasy flowers. But still. Why so these huge conglomerates? And why have they been forgotten in later Dara tradition? They are just poof, gone in the <coughs> middle of the ones that are being uh, done today. Of course, most often the uh, huge conglomerates of houses are meant to depict biblical cities. Uh, and in this case, there can be absolutely no doubt that the conglomerate represents Jerusalem. But look at the city. It's enormous and totally forbidding. There's no empty way. There is no if the car had found no way to get in to the Jerusalem. He couldn't have been that enough. He was very skilled. He could have figured out a way to open up the doors to Jerusalem. But this Jerusalem is impenetrable. I would love to talk about that. I'm sorry, I won't. Um, <laughs> let's look at the lower left corner. Yeah. And that is the one existing painting of, by a folk artist of the descent from the cross. And uh, we see three men on very rickety ladders, the kinds of ladders that might have been used in the construction work. And they have just, just taken down the limp body of Christ from the cross. Two of them are obviously Dalekarian neighbors, and the third, who is more elegantly dressed than the others, he would be uh, Joseph Arimathea of Joseph of Arimathea. Is that what you say in English? Okay, thank you. And he was the one who had procured uh, uh, permission to take down Christ's body and who wrapped it in a clean linen cloth as it says in man. But there is more to the scene, obviously. You know, one of the laborers triumphantly holds up a pair of flyers with a name. Now, some of the people who have interpreted this painting imagine that this was 
the invention of the Picard. Uh, those who are familiar with great European artistic tradition realize that this, uh, that the nail and the cross, uh, the nail of the fire is together with the spear and the crown. They often appear together as symbols of Christ's suffering. The question is, how in the world did Dietrich Card pick up the idea to paint the descent from the cross? And believe me, I spent a lot of time at the Royal Library looking at prints, uh, trying to go over what's in the churches in Dolan and elsewhere, speaking to uh, great um, uh, specialists in art history. Nobody could come up with the answer. It looks a bit the composition as a comp like a composition by Rembrandt uh, 150 years earlier, but I don't know. I'm no clue. So there's a job here for you. <laughs> <laughs> you might find it very interesting. But regardless of the source <coughs> of the idea, it seems to me that Vintercross painting communicates, it communicates piety and what one might call a remarkable power of presence. It is in its use of everyday detail, and in his ability to show us brief and compelling moments of action that Vintercross blends the events of Golgotha with his own power, with his own here and now. He was then the pioneer and representative of an early artistic peak of doll painting. Many engaging artists were to follow, and there was to be <coughs> great diversity of styles in the first five decades of the 1800s, more or less through the 1850s. Just to say very quickly, I'm not going to comment, you can think about it. <coughs> yeah. Somebody obviously was busy with the ruler here to get that big city right. Uh, you see what And this is not Jerusalem, but of course, which city I'm talking about here? Nineveh. And here is Jonah crying under the curve in some way, or the tree. <coughs> this one was painted in, in the early 1806, I believe it was. Um, the in interior of a church, if he finds several interiors, but I love it the way that the women and the men are separated. <laughs> <laughs> Another painter here, oh, once again, you see the details of everyday construction life. But increasingly, during the 19th century, so-called realistic topic, subjects became more visible or could be seen on the paintings. This kind of an interior would have been unheard of in the uh, uh, late 18th century, but it is heard of, this one was made in 1844, as you can see, and it's the interior of a shoemaker's uh, uh, shop. And uh, you find more and more of these kinds of realistic subjects. And toward the end of the period, toward the late 1850s and 1860s, you could get pictures like this, which are totally without floral composition, no big houses. This is, in fact, the, uh, the uh, oh, how can I say this? <laughs> in English, it's the uh, local district court, the final, the feasting that was taking place when the court had stopped being in action. And this was a painting that was that the painter was invited to do. Thinking about how they are written for uh, the goods. And the painter, this is me, he says, standing there fiddling. Um, this could easily also, this is 1860 now, this could easily have been made in American folk art. 
about this very time. But the flowers kept on existing on these little things. Uh, they had totally forgotten about them. They were on there. And by the 1870s, it would seem that the Dalana tradition, the great tradition represented by the Intercala and the others, had outlived itself. But now, something new happened, several new things happened. One of them was that museum founders and other people interested in, suddenly interested in peasant art, were getting into the act. You've got to preserve the old peasant art. It is about to disappear. I may say so, it was, but that's another story. <laughs> it was thought by museum founders such as Arthur Hasselius, who founded both the Nordic Museum and Skansen, that we have to get out there and preserve all of this. And because industrialization is encroaching upon us, and we have to see to it that traditional arts are preserved. By, the by this time, the people out in the villages weren't one bit interested, because they had begun buying wallpaper, and what they put on their walls was increasingly the photographs. The world had changed. But the preservers were in the act. Uh, and the uh, many artists, the Karin and Carl Larson, the Sorens, and many others settled in Dalarna to make sure that they were surrounded by this wonderful art. And all kinds of new practices, new kinds of Dala painting. Now, I am not showing this in absolutely uh, correct uh, uh, order, but you can see all of them everywhere. And it was something very different from the, uh, this is Jan Knight, Mester, a, a great artist in the parish house in Rettli. Uh This is the great the Riddelin Strem. And all of a sudden, what you see, who, 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 who wrote the, the play on the road to heaven? Yeah, somebody can translate it. He does yes, but translate it, please. <laughs> okay. But here, all of a sudden, you find all the details that are presumably Swedish, down to Lucia Bonds, and uh, he's kind of preserved the house and the curbs, but it's a very, very different kind of feel over, uh, over this painting. Not to speak of the countless posters that were being produced in the teens and the 1920s. And all of a sudden, we've got it all over there. Uh, you know, the happy middle class family dancing around the tree, the skiers of the Vasa competition. Uh, and it's all integrated into a very, very new kind of uh, art. In other words, Dala painting eventually came to signify the most decorative, the most charming, the most appealing aspects of Sweden's national heritage. The religious messages and the harsh conditions of 18th century peasant life were forgotten, were not interesting. And I'm almost getting to it, I am, but not quite. If you can make it, it's not so Ah, Carl Arson got into the act. And where did he go? Well, he settled in Dalarna, huh? with his wife, Carl. And uh, in this wonderful place called Sundborn, which many of you have, been, have visited. But he loved the big trip, where Carl Linke Carl had painted um, more than a hundred years earlier. And there he is in 1917. Carl Larson paints this very lovely young lady from Retvi in front of the painting that you just saw by by uh, Winter Carl, the painting of the descent from the cross. 
Now, this painting has been mostly <coughs> unknown in this week. Nobody knew that Carl Arson had painted precisely this one. Uh, until, and once again, the year is 2007, I don't know how it happened, but uh, in this year, this painting surfaced in an auction. Carl Arson had sold it to an Austrian buyer, and it had been sitting, sitting in a home in Austria for all these years. And what we can see on this painting, and this, well, this I find it very interesting, is that when Carl Larson painted it in 1970, the lower left corner was not damaged. So you can see what the car had actually painted at the time, or just about, in Carl Larson's uh, uh, copy here. So we see that there are two female figures, presumably the two males, and one man ready with the white cloth to receive the limp body of Christ. And these are the kinds of turnarounds in our history that are, in fact, interesting. But nevertheless, what Carl Arson paints here is, in my way, something cute and decorative, appealing, maybe sweet and cute, but decorative and appealing in ways that certainly Vincent and Carl did not. This is sentimental And at the very same time, all kinds of, this was the nostalgia, the sentimentalization that became standardized. And now we are all done. But I uh, like to ask the backtrack because there is one more thing to follow. And that is, that all that construction of a Swedish folk heritage in Sweden, all that construction in Sweden of a folk heritage focused on Dalarna, it took place exactly at the same time as emigration from Sweden and immigration into this country was at its height. Namely, from the very late 1860s, and this was founded in 1860, and up through the 1920s, up to the 1920s, when the quota laws were in effect, became effective in this country. And for millions of Swedish immigrants at this time, for millions of Swedish immigrants in America, the dollar horses, the dollar paintings, the dollar costumes, they became important symbols of a country they had left but still felt very much attached. And a constant flow of new immigrants and new uses uh, of these symbols on industrial products, on uh, postcards, on cookie jars, reinforced the ongoing uh, efforts to, this, to execute this kind of symbol making in America. Also, swords effort were important in reinforcing the symbol building in America. I mean, Sorn visited the United States many times, the painter Sorn. He also painted several American presidents and was immensely wealthy. But he brought with him dollar horses. <laughs> and not only that, Sweden used the dollar horse, an immense one, in the World Exhibition in New York in 1939. The dollar horse three meters high was launched in this country. And it did not take long before Americans of Swedish descent, and also others, started using the Dalekarian symbols in new and very inventive ways. And we have examples of here. Ways that were totally unknown in Sweden, that wouldn't possibly have popped into the heads of Swedes. In Mora, Minnesota, the world's largest dollar horse was put up. Uh, that's me underneath. <laughs> kind of blend into this picture of, and it did but a few years later, Augusta, the city in southern Dalarna, put up an even larger one. <laughs> and in other words, the cultural flow between 
America and Swedish America began going both ways. Swedes were beginning to learn from Swedish America. I can tell you more about this, but some other time. And this has happened very much during the last few decades of the previous century. Um, and yet, it is here that we find the widest and the largest hordes of dollar horses. One little comment. Both here and in Sweden today, the dollar symbols serve well in the new contexts and configurations. Sweden keeps on using the orange dollar horses as a logo in world exhibitions, for example, as recently as the world exhibition in Shanghai. Indeed, even if Linsborg or other towns in America or towns in Sweden or Sweden itself, even if they have paid millions and millions of dollars to an inventive advertising consultant, that person could not in a million years have come up with a logo that would serve our communities as well on global arenas as the dollar horse. The dollar horse. <laughs> I mean, speaking about effective brand recognition, who could beat this kind of historical depth in a logo? I sometimes wondered what Dean the Carl and the other dollar painters, early dollar painters, would have said. Well, most likely they would have looked upon the latest historical developments with great favor. Thank you.
has been spoken about as the initial period of modernity. Uh, and uh, is this in fact what was moving around in their heads? I have no idea. I haven't seen it stated anywhere. I can guess, but we can't. Anybody else? Other questions? Other questions? How many of you have been to the uh, to the world's largest dollar horse, horse at, at Mora, Minnesota? <laughs> and how many of you have been to the one at Alvesta? In Sweden. How many of you have been to both? Anybody been to both? <laughs> There's just three of us. So we can share our stories. <laughs> any, any other questions? I have a question. Sure. On several websites, you hear me this story about the Swedish dollar horse. That is um, the Swedish dollar horse is the legend of the body. So maybe it is the myth about it. Um, that it has a connection with some soldier that was brought it back or had it with them, a soldier that was serving Sweden under called the Torus or Gustavus Adolphus or something. I, I'm, I'm always stunned when I read these things. I've never heard about it. But. Yeah. Well, that, that's of course the most wonderful part of studying folklore. They can start realizing all the wonderful stories that people attribute to the beginnings of things, to explain things. Uh, I can't believe this is really, I mean, uh, there is no so-called factual foundation of the story. On the other hand, a lot of folk artists in Sweden did specialize in painting horses and kings. This is true, for example, of a gentleman called Gustav <coughs> Reuter in Helsingland, and he had been a soldier. So there may be some kind of imaginary connection there. But I don't know that. Reuter's work is fantastic. I don't have any example of it. You can see it on the camera. Does the curvets resemble any kind of flower that? Uh, Beg your pardon. Does the curvets resemble any kind of flower that Victor Carl would have had access to? Not that we know of. No, I'm sure he took it, 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 it from having both looked at the rock core developments, the the whole kind, the shell shapes, and he mixed together. No, it's a fantasy flower. Absolutely. Okay, and then the other question is, I think someplace around here in Lindsbury, they say that that was Jonah's tree, was the origin of that. Yeah. Is that uh... Where are now, we <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'm fine. The word, Kerbix, which I avoided trying to explain, was the, the, folk, the painters of Dalana never, ever used it. They didn't even use the word Dalana painting. They called it Rose Morning, Rose Morning, exactly the same word as the word in Norwegian. Or they spoke about good morning, which meant figure painting with old men painting. Uh, but they crimsing, meaning decoration, they could use it. Never ever heard it. This word was introduced into the discourse by the poet Erik Axel Karl Felt in the 19-teens, 20s, uh, f because this was the word, hold on now, this was the word used in the old translation of the Swedish Bible, the Bible that circulated prior to 1970s. And that was the word that was used for the tree that God made growing up beside Jonah when Jonah was suffering in the horrible heat. Now, and for some wacky reason, <laughs> the word Kermit was introduced into scholarly discourse, and now it's used all over. But it was really Carlsen's introduction of a word that no longer is used to in Swedish at all. But for that reason, it may be a useful Term uh, to use in scholarly discourse. It's all over. Yeah. Great one. Why don't you give her another hand? Let's have some. <laughs>